Hello everyone, I'm Penny Lewis, Executive Director of the Ecological Landscape Alliance, and I'll be the moderator for the webinar today. Today's presentation is Understanding Roots, Exploring Plants Underground. This is one of the Focus on Sustainability webinars. This series was developed by a group of regional organizations known for their quality ecological education. By working together, the webinar series enables us to expand the reach of our individual programs to a broader audience. In case you're not familiar with our organizations, they're all nonprofit and largely volunteer groups in the United States. The regional groups are the Ecological Landscape Alliance, the Chesapeake Conservation Landscaping Council, the Midwest Ecological Landscape Alliance, and Ecolandscape California. If you have a question for the presenter, you may send it to us using the question window at any time during the broadcast, and questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. And now I would like to introduce our presenter, Robert Curick. Robert began his career in organic landscape man maintenance in 1974. Over the next four decades, he honed his horticulture-related skills by working with clients throughout the United States on varied projects from water gardens, paths and patios, to habitat gardens and innovative playgrounds. Robert has written 14 books on creating sustainable homes and gardens. His book, Designing and Maintaining Your Edible Landscape Naturally, has become a classic in its field, defining the field of gardening known as edible landscaping and focusing on organic, natural, sustainable, and integrated systems. And today he'll share his insights into roots. Welcome, Robert. Hi, Penny. Should I start? Here we go. So the title of the book is Understanding Roots, Discover How to Make Your Garden Flourish. Now, most people who are listening to me have probably planted a tree, a shrub, or a vegetable. So they may be wondering, well, what am I going to talk about? Well, I'm going to talk about some of the concepts of root growth that you may not have heard of. And if we can learn more about roots, we can get better plants and we can help our garden flourish. So the important word in the title really is the word flourish. A lot of people are not aware of how big a root system can be. This is a single kidney bean, the root system of the top six inches looking down from above. And it's basically over four feet, uh, close to four feet in all directions, one single plant. So that root systems are explore far more soil than a lot of people give them credit for. But it all begins with the litter. The litter in the forest and the top, the, the slightly decomposed material beneath the duff, and then the soil. And what's so important about the soil in the forest is that it's a, extremely uh, vital to have the top two to four inches in a very good form because the plants prefer that amount of soil. In other words, the pot on the left the soil gathered from the forest in the one to two inch zone. The pot in the middle is soil only from the two to four inch zone, and the one on the right is the subsoil. So you can see that even the in top two inches is a radically different amount of growth compared to the, the two to four inch zone. So we'll be seeing how important the aerobic layers are as we go through the presentation. But keep this in mind that the top two inches is about 50% more growth than gathering soil just from the two to four inch zone. So let's look at some of the myths of roots and how we can understand those myths, correct them, and get better plants. First guideline is that roots grow way beyond the canopy or the drip line. Many people think that the roots grow primarily out to the drip line, and that's the best place to put water, compost, mulch, etc. In reality, we see it in this chart that the roots can be half again wider than the foliage in a heavy soil, three times wider than the foliage in a loamy soil, and believe it or not, in a soil that forces the roots near the surface, a very heavy clay, where the roots may not be able to go very deep at all, the root system can be five times wider or greater uh, than the canopy. Now, this is because it's trying to get enough cubic volume of soil to explore. Uh, it can't go deep when it's a heavy clay, so it has to go far and wide. 
to gather those nutrients. And here's the fascinating thing of the people try to protect trees in our area with, during construction with these orange uh, uh, fences. And they put the fence now out, out to about the drip line thinking, well, they're protecting the tree. Well, they are protecting the, the uh, uh, trunk from damage. But in reality, the area beyond the fence is where there's more feeding roots than the area inside the fence. So it becomes kind of an irony that in an attempt to protect the tree, they're forcing the heavy equipment to work right in the area where the, we find the most feeding roots. Here we see uh, on this uh, drawing done by a Russian that the apple tree has a drip line in the red circle and the roots extend far beyond that circle. Each square is one meter. So you can see that going to the lower left hand corner is close to two meters further out from the uh, foliage. Um, and so that the apple tree is gathering its nutrients from lots of different areas, but also it's not completely symmetrical because of soil type. Soil type has a great big influence on how the roots grow. So we have to keep that in mind as we go through the presentation. Here's an example. The, the uh, roots up here in the top are going beyond that dotted line. That's the canopy. And this is a sandy soil. But we're in the bottom, it's a loamy soil. And so the, you see that the root system in the loamy soil in this particular situation, not very many roots are growing out beyond the foliage. But in a sandy soil, we get a lot of growth beyond the foliage. And part of the reason is this is a dwarfing rootstock called M4 uh, used with apple trees. And it keeps the, tr the root system a little bit more constrained compared to other uh, rootstocks. So the rootstocks have a, a big influence on how fruit trees grow and where the roots grow beyond the foliage. Here we see another drawing from Russia. And the fruit trees, again, have a drip line in red. And we see that the, each uh, square is a meter. And the roots grow extremely far away from the canopy on this apple. But they avoid the road and the compaction of the road. So we can see that the trees are responding to the poor quality of compacted soil. Now, a lot of people think that all trees have a taproot. Well, here's an example of an oak tree that does have a taproot. In this case, a majority of the roots are in the surface, but the taproot goes down close to a little over eight feet. Um, and this on the left is the measuring bar, and this is in centimeters and about 31 centimeters to a foot. So if we go up here at 40 centimeters, we see that a huge proportion of the roots are above 40 centimeter mark. So that we find that in a, even though there's a deep tap root, there's a large number of roots spreading out sideways in the top foot of the soil. And you can see the closer you get to the surface, the more roots you have. Another important part of this illustration is that Look how small the tree is relative to the roots. What the plant looks like above ground is no indication whatsoever of what's going on below ground. So we will have trees that are very large, but their root system will oftentimes be much wider than the foliage. So there are about 2% of all the trees have tap roots. Uh, usually it's oaks, pines, and nut trees are the biggest category of trees with tap roots. Here's another of the same oak in a different soil, so the root system is not nearly as deep. The tap roots are more divided, but again, the shallow roots at the top spread quite wide and have a, a large majority of the root system above the tap root. You can see in the drawing the little acorn and how it starts, it develops a tap root right off beginning to get established, but as it gets established, the laterals that go to the side uh, develop, and you can have then the kind of root system that likes to be in an aerobic environment. So the, the reason these roots are growing sideways is in part is due to the fact that they want to use the aerobic soils because that's where the 
you get the most rapid release of nutrients. So that all the critters that like to release nutrients like an aerobic environment, um, and that's in the surface of the soil, so the roots are exploring the soil volume where those things like to live. Now here's a tree that's native to my area, the Douglas fir. Again, you can see that it has a, a fairly deep root system down to about 8 or 10 feet, but it, it's on a slope and it has more roots downhill than it has uphill. Now this is not a guideline. It does vary from plant to plant. In all the root drawings I have, you cannot come up with a generalization as to whether or not the trees predominantly grow downhill compared to uphill uh, slope. But keep that in mind anyway that the roots tend to be wider than you might expect on a slope than on a level ground. Now here's a pine tree. Uh, it's a very short tree, uh, but the root system goes down 150 centimeters, so that's about five feet. But we see that they have what's called sinker roots. Sinker roots are not found in a lot of trees except for fruit trees, but here's a pine tree where the sinker roots go down and they gather water and nutrients, but they also anchor the tree to provide a lot of stability uh, for the tree when wind hits it. Here's a plum tree uh, ex excavated by a researcher in Hungary, and you can see the top 40 inches of the soil is a huge percentage of the root system. This zone here that doesn't have roots is because it was taken care of with clean cultivation. They uh, plowed the field to keep the weeds down, but because they plowed and the plow went down two, four, six, eight inches deep, it destroyed the hair roots and the young roots that like to be in that aerobic zone. So the more that we avoid compaction and tillage, the happier the roots will be because they can grow right up to the very surface and explore the aerobic zone and gather nutrients from the critters that like to make that available. So here they are. Here's some examples. Algae, fungi, actinomycetes, and bacteria. Now the algae on the right-hand side is a blue-green algae, which is very uh, nutritious for the plants. In the top three inches, there's 25 units of this algae. You go down to eight inches, there's only one-fifth the amount of uh, critters, five compared to 25. You go down to 26 inches and there's almost nothing. So you can see in all these four what I call critters um, that the drop from the first three inches to eight inches is a phenomenal reduction in the number of beneficial uh, bacteria, fungi, algae, actinomycetes. So in the case of actinomycetes, which are nitrogen-fixing uh, critters that are kind of like half bacteria and half algae. Uh, when you make that jump from three inches to eight inches, you go down and you by a factor of 10. Same thing happens with water. This is a, a chart of the water absorption of a number of crops. What we find in almost all these drawings, except the ones I uh, showed you of Doug Furs, a lot of research in America has been done with uh, crops, uh, not ornamentals, in order to help the farmer get the best growth possible. But here we see the top foot of the soil is close to 50% on some plants, and if you go down two feet deep, it's over 50% on almost all plants, the amount of water that's absorbed. So the top one to two feet is absolutely critical. Um, and a lot of people think, well, you know, the trees can have really deep roots, and an almond does, but it still gets 50% of its growth in the top three feet, even though its roots go down to 12 feet or deeper. So that you may not be growing sugar beets, but taking care of that top foot is 34% of all the water and nutrients that are going to be absorbed by the tree. Now, this is what we have to prevent, mulching, what I call the donut of death. This is uh, taken in my hometown in St. Louis, Missouri, and it seems to be a contest in St. Louis at least. I don't know if it's happening in your area, but I, I hope not. But in St. Louis, there's this contest to see who can put the mulch the deepest 
and the highest and the widest, um, and they're bearing the crown of the root system. So what a lot of us think is that over time, these trees are going to die uh, much earlier than they need to because of the lack of air at the, at the crown of the root system where it meets the trunk and the possibility that rain kept in contact with that trunk combined with moisture and heat in the summer can speed up the rot of the root system or the trunk. So we want to try to train people not to do this. Now this is actually a photograph taken in front of the art museum in the city of St. Louis. And even the city workers are doing these incredible volcanoes of mulch, which are something we've got to work against every chance we get. Now here we see a better way of approaching mulch, and that is to provide mulch at least to the drip line. And the further away from the drip line, it's even better. So that many people have put their mulch in the first two, three, four feet maybe from the trunk, thinking that's where the feeding roots are. But as the tree gets older, the trunk, the roots near the trunk actually develop like a bark surface. So when you have bark, you do not have root hairs. So by mulching near the first foot or so, it's completely useless as the tree gets older because there are not a lot of feeding roots there. Well, what's ironic about this photo is that this is taken at the world headquarters of Monsanto. Uh, it's actually one of the best looking landscapes I've seen and then one of the few examples I can find where the mulch is, has expanded beyond the, the trunk fairly decent distance. Uh, but I got these photos before they could chase me off the site. Now, I always plant high. I plant on a mound, even if it's not clay, for a bunch of reasons. One, I do want to have drainage in clay soils. So the, keeping the crown above the level of the existing soil uh, helps the water drain away and prevent root rot or phytophthora. Um, but the, one of the other reasons I plant high is I want to get the roots to grow away from the planting area. Um, and I do that by planting high so the roots grow beyond the mound as soon as possible. So I mulch the mound after I've planted. I've watered in the plant. And I don't have to water for quite a while until the roots grow beyond the planting area. Now, th this illustration is poorly done in the sense that there's a darker zone in the middle and then it looks like uh, white beyond that. That's not to indicate that the soil is different there. Uh, when you plant trees, you should not use any amendments. And the reason for that is we want to get the roots used to the soil they're going to have to grow in. Since the trees have roots that grow half again to three to five times wider than the foliage, they're going to have to get used to soil that we can't possibly dig a hole big enough for. So I tend to avoid any compost whatsoever because it keeps the roots bound up into the planting area while they're feeding on all the highly nutritious stuff. And when they run out and try to grow beyond it, they're less likely to be well established. And also I, do, I don't do a planting hole because the roots, if you mix it up with too much compost, the roots grow through the planting mix and hit the brick wall, so to speak, of the existing soil. So when you're getting the roots to be established in the soil that they're going to constantly grow in for the rest of their life, you do have to get the right rootstock for the right soil. In other words, in a clay soil, you cannot plant peaches and expect to get good growth or keep the tree even alive. So plums and apples are better for a heavy clay soil than peaches, so that if you have heavy soil and you want peaches, you basically have to build up a very high mound or a box and treat it more like a container plant. So here we see a tree that's planted on a mound. This is at the Missouri Botanic Garden in St. Louis. And you'll notice there's an interesting thing. There's no root flare. Normally when you have a tree, um, you can even kind of see it all the way back here. There's a wider section where the trunks splays out from the, near the surface of the soil. So I'm wondering if they actually messed up here and um, put mulch over the root flare, which is what they should not have done. But the tree here is planted on a mound 
which encourages a wider root system. So in this particular planting situation, my house in Occidental, this is a composting pile of wood chips from the tree service, a mixture of leaves and wood chips, and it has then four to six inches of soil added on top. And then even though there's a four to six inch layer of soil on top of a three foot high mound of chips, I still plant with them in a small mound as you can see over here with the shovel. So even though uh, there's a high drainage area, I still always improve the drainage by planting as high as I can. You'll see uh, in this drawing, I mean in this photograph, uh, lavenders and rosemaries, and they're just a number of the plants I, I grow this way in Occidental. And because I plant in the fall only, and the roots grow throughout the entire winter in, in our moderate California climate, um, the plants are very well established come spring, and I have never watered these plantings in 30 years because I established a root system in a proper way, and I used an awful lot of mulch. And this is the type of mulch I, we use in our area. It's called arbor mulch. But it's important to have mulch, of course, in most any landscape design. Um, but I feel that if you go above, if you're buying mulch, Going above four inches deep is probably a waste of money. In other words, once you get above four inches in mulch, the cost for additional mulch has a diminishing return on how much moisture it's going to conserve. So I say four inches max, at least two inches. But in New England, where you guys are, you have a fascinating situation where a lot of the trees actually like to grow roots more in the duff and the humus than the soil itself. So you can see uh, from these trees in North Finland that the young spruce tree has 64% of its roots in the duff, not even in the soil. So maintaining a thick natural leaf litter that you would find in the forest is extremely important in how the, you can maintain healthy trees. Now we look at a little bit of vegetables. This is uh, corn. Looking down from the top, each square is one square, one foot square. These uh, excavations were done by Dr. Weaver back in the 30s in Nebraska. And he spent countless hours digging out root systems and mapping them uh, like he would in an archaeological dig. Here we see that the root system is one, two, three, four, five squares wide. So it's well over five feet in all direction for one single corn plant. Here we look at an onion, no tap root on the onion, and the roots grow from the bottom of the onion, and they go sideways and down, but they don't go back up to the surface. So it's uh, a nice way to realize that we don't we don't have to worry so much about if we're going to cultivate the soil uh, near the onions to keep weeds down. If you go down just an inch or two at the most, you won't hit any roots. Um, but if you go deeper, uh, using like a rototiller to control weeds, you got a big problem. You'll hit a lot of roots. Lettuce does have a tap root, but it has a majority of its roots other than the tap root. And here we see roots going down three feet and deeper. But take a look at the top foot. The top foot has uh, enormous percentage of the roots of the lettuce. The second foot has more of the roots, I mean some more of the roots. So if you were to make a raised bed uh, out of wood, let's say, uh, two feet high, you would probably get, in this case, 80, 90, 95 percent of the roots contained within that raised bed. Um, well, I'm thinking about California. <laughs> we have gophers, so we do raised beds in order to put wire on the bottom of the box so the gophers can't come up and chew into the roots. So when we have raised beds it's in my area, it's part primarily to offset the damage of gophers. So I used to do 2 by 12s to keep the cost down, and now I do uh, two 2 by 12s so that the box is almost 24 inches high. And that keeps a huge percentage of the root system away from the gophers and it keeps the uh, roots happy 
and it keeps my back happier since I don't have to bend over as much. Now carrots, as we would expect, have a tap root. This one going down past seven feet. Uh, we again see there's a, a fair number of roots going down as, as much as four and five feet deep. But again, the top foot has a, a fairly a large percentage of the roots of the carrot. But when you pull a carrot out, you see a few little white scraggly roots. You think, oh, there's not much left. Well, you've left this enormous root system in the soil, which as it decomposes, is sort of like a little underground uh, compost system. So that growing roots can improve the soil, especially if you have a massive root system like you get from a carrot. And here we see a tomato, and it's, each square is one foot, so we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight feet wide, and uh, up to three feet deep. Um, again, the tomato is much like lettuce and other vegetables. The top foot is extremely important. And here we see, again, that the top above ground has nothing to do as far as indicating what's going on below ground. The tree on the right is a sour cherry tree, that black root system. It goes down to about eight feet in this particular example. Whereas horseradishes have been dug up, the roots down to 14 to 16 feet deep. So that the horseradish, which has foliage maybe up to two to four feet high above the ground, has a massively deep root system compared to a cherry tree, which might have foliage up to 10, 12, 15, 20 feet. And we see again that the lima bean and the carrot uh, can get down to four feet, no problem. Now, I don't know how many of you use drip irrigation, but I've included this uh, illustration of drip irrigation basically because I want you to understand that putting the emitters or the water at the drip line and beyond is more important than putting it near the trunk. As I mentioned before, as the trunk ages, this section of the trunk becomes more bark-like. And the more the feeding roots are out here, the young tender growth, so the root hairs are out and the small little rootlets. When I plant a bare root tree like this, I put the emitters day one at the drip line because I want to encourage these roots to grow beyond the planting area. You can see here that I like to use what's called inline emitter tubing. It has emitters built inside the tubing every 12 inches in this case. And it looks like there's a lot of dry soil, like the roots aren't going to get any water over here. But looking at it from underground, when you have it every 12 inches in a loamy soil, down two, four, six inches deep, those little bulges uh, get together and make one continuous moist zone. So I like to use parallel lines of this inline emitter tubing throughout the landscape, like we see in the bottom. Uh, illustration here. The dotted line is the foliage, and these were established trees that, that I added drip lines to, avoiding the trunks and providing lots of points of irrigation that underneath the ground have a continuous moisture zone so you get the, absolutely the, the best growth uh, possible. Uh, there's been a lot of studies in vegetables uh, of root systems relative to drip. And they find over and over again that using drip irrigation might reduce your water use by 30 to 50 to 60 percent, but yields go up. So one woman in India was growing chilies, and she had a water savings of about 38 percent, but her chili yield went up 48 percent. So I have a, a little uh, ebook on my website that talks about. Uh, why is it and how is it that drip irrigation can actually improve the yields of a plant and improve the growth of a plant? So we get back to the end of the session, uh, and I'm ready to take questions. So Penny, fire away with questions people might have. Okay, excellent. The first question is about your illustrations. You have amazing illustrations, and you mentioned that some of them that were developed in the 30s 
were done in a, an archaeological dig manner. The, this question is, how were the other root structures studied, such as the large trees, to develop these drawings? Good question. Well, they were actually done the same way. They used, it's called a skeleton method, where you dig a trench and you follow out the root system as wide as it goes, and you dig the trench as deep as the root system goes, and you map it, you draw it. So these were people in Germany and Austria that had been over the last 30 years exploring the root system uh, uh, by digging the soil up and mapping it, just like the guy did, Dr. Weaver did in Nebraska. And they oftentimes do a root map in Germany from looking down from the top of the plant. They follow the root system out and they dig down four to six inches to map out the width of the root system. Uh, I have one photograph I found in a book which shows five, six people on their knees excavating the soil from the upper zone of the root system of a tree. And there's one guy in the background just standing there not doing anything. So I figure that's the professor and the people actually doing the work are all the students and grad students that have to do the digging. Okay. Uh, the next question is about your planting technique. You mentioned that you don't dig a planting hole. So what can you elaborate on the process that you use for planting a tree? Okay, so what I tend to do is I, I don't have to uh, put all the roots above the grade of the existing grade, but I put uh, as many of the roots as it's convenient. So I make a mound somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 6 to 12 to 18 inches high, depending on the soil type. And then I keep it open with a spading fork to insert the bare root tree or the container. Now, if the mound is, if the root system is deeper than the mound is high, I start first by forking the soil with a spading fork to heave it and crack it, but not invert it because we saw that the soil life prefers that top one to three to four inches more so than, than uh, even just eight inches down. So if you take a shovel and you dig a hole and you just arbitrarily uh, heave the soil over and invert it, the bacteria that like the aerobic environment tend to die or go dormant. Um, and it takes a while for them to repopulate in the aerobic zone where they like to be. So, same thing happens with the anaerobic bacteria. They're down deeper in the soils you turn them upside down and they start to oxidize and die from too much oxygen. So basically, I start with the soil, I uh, skim the roots off of any weeds or sod, I fork the area that I'm going to plant in with a spading fork, heaving it back and forth, not inverting it. I gather enough soil from the area to make a mound, and then I pull the mound open enough to insert the container plant or the bare root plant, and then I mulch uh, the mound very heavily, uh, but I keep the mulch away from the trunk because, one, we don't want to get root rot from the moisture of the mulch, keeping it at the crown of the root system. And two, by keeping the crown of the root system dry with no irrigation whatsoever, it encourages and stimulates the roots to grow out from the planting area and not just hover around and circle around in the same place. Um, so I think if that covers, I, I think I covered it all. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, the next question is about the, the mulch itself. Is You mentioned that you use arbor mulch. The question is, is that the same as Ramiel wood mulch? Well, see, that's because I live in California. I don't know what that name means. And you don't know what arbor mulch means. <laughs> arbor mulch is a trade name, so the commercial product in my area that's basically chipped up from tree services. So it has both leaf and chips in it. And it's chipped in a way that creates all different kinds of sizes of material, from dust to pieces up to a quarter inch, a little few little pieces, maybe half an inch. But the nice thing about having that variety of lots of different sizes all the way down to almost dust, is that it decomposes quicker. So this particular mulch 
um, will decompose and become like a soil in three to five years. Whereas if you just use big chunky wood chips, they can last there for decades almost uh, before they actually improve the soil from the top down. Okay, so it does sound like that is is very similar. Ramiel wood mulch is uh, the combination and it includes especially the growing buds, so all of the small branches, uh, I think up to an inch and a half or so okay. in diameter. So yeah. it, it apparently is the same product. The next question is, is there something that can be done with site prep or maintenance to encourage the sinker roots that you discuss, discussed for stability in windy areas? Well, basically, it, you just have to not to disturb the soil and let the roots adjust to what's there. Um, in other words, the, you don't stimulate more sinker roots by doing something. You, the tree produces the same amount of sinker roots uh, unless you uh, totally abuse the situation. Um, but um, it's dependent upon the soil depth. Like the, one of the problems with most of the root drawings I showed you is they were on a very good soil, so you've got roots down to four feet deep, uh, like lettuce. But at my house, um, the roots, uh, this clay is only 18 inches down, so the roots are hitting that clay layer and going sideways. So even though my apple tree would like to have sinker roots to stabilize it, they're really not going down more than the 18 inches of good soil before it hit the clay. And very few roots get into that clay. So the sinker roots are basically dependent upon uh, the depth of the soil, and you have to have a very wide root system then to s compensate for the lack of uh, sinker roots. So I might mention that what I did with one planting in an area that gets winds every winter up to 90 miles an hour, is I planted very small trees, less than a foot high. I planted them amongst other shrubbery so that the trees as they grew would get buffered around by the wind and blow back and forth but not fall over. And when you allow the trees to bend as opposed to staking them, they get a much stronger trunk, uh, bigger diameter and sturdier. And so I kept the water away from the planting area, encouraging much wider root system for stability. And because I planted the trees as very young trees 10 years later, or four years later, they were 10 feet tall, and they were the only trees in that suburb of 300 houses that had never been staked. It was a combination of planting small and watering far away. Interesting. The next question is, what is your view about the role of compost tea? <laughs> well, the um, I need to see more studies. I, there's a woman up in Washington State, Linda Chalker Scott, uh, and she is absolutely adamant everything has to be substantiated by peer-reviewed research. And there are I haven't found any peer-reviewed research of compost tea. My feeling is that. Um, especially where you have summer rains, adding the compost to the surface and letting the rains uh, seep into it is as good or better than going through all the effort of making compost tea. I don't think it can hurt, that's for sure. I don't think it's worth paying for. Um, I tend to think that uh, compost by itself can have a great big influence and it doesn't have to be converted uh, to tea, but I get in big trouble sometimes when I say that. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next question is, given how far roots extend past the drip line, what recommendations would you give for protecting trees during construction? Well, see, that's the problem. Most root systems are extremely wide, so like in a suburban area, in our area, new subdivisions, uh, the house slot is like 50 60 feet wide and 100 feet deep. Well, if, if you're going to try to establish an oak tree, its root systems would prefer that entire area. And if there's an existing oak tree, the root system is going to be all the way into a neighbor's property. So it becomes um, 
impractical to try to protect all the roots beyond the drip line. That would be the ideal, to protect the roots beyond the drip line as opposed to spinning, being fixated on what's growing within, within the uh, canopy area. So it becomes a trade-off and a lot of times you just have to put up with the damage that the, that the critters are, I mean the machinery is going to make and how it's going to destroy critters and damage uh, mycorrhizal fungi and then try to rehab it afterwards by a very thick mulch, no, no soil disturbance and let the soil redevelop so to speak from the top down. Okay. What are your thoughts on the donuts that folks often use to keep trees watered after initial installation? Well, if, if the if the donut of mulch is not touching the trunk, that's okay. So, um, but I think the mulch needs to go further out when it, even when it's planted uh, early on to protect the roots because the roots are going to grow pretty fast. In other words, if you plant a tree in a in a planting mound um, and it's uh, like bare root, uh, in our area it rains in the winter and it dries up in the summer, but we don't have to water till May or June if it's been well mulched. Um, so I, that's why I put the drip system beyond the edge of the mound because the roots are going to easily get there in the first one to two months worth of growth. But in your area, I would say the the, the mound, the donut, uh, should be as wide as possible. Uh, even though the tree may seem young, the roots are going to want to grow pretty far. Did that answer the question? Do you think? I well, I just got a follow-up question. This okay. this viewer is actually asking about the products that are used that they fill with water. Oh, you, those green. The, they're in our area. They're green, and um, they're bags, and they tie them to the trunk of a new tree, and it's sort of like a slow drip system. Is that what you're yes. talking about? You think? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, those are. Um, oh, it's it's not what I would do, but given the urban setting and the lack of uh, money for drip irrigation or the lack of people to drive around and water by hand, um, it's a good way to get a tree going, but it should be taken away as soon as the tree gets established and let the tree start to explore as much soil volume as it needs to. Um, in my book, I have a chart that shows you how much soil volume you need to keep a root system happy based on the trunk diameter. So I think in that chart, if the trunk diameter is 16 inches, based on the chart, you need over 1,000 cubic feet of soil to keep the root system for that tree happy. Um, so the thought of trying to maintain the tree with those little green bags is ludicrous, but they're a good way to get it started in the first few months of course, you guys, the summer rains could pick up the slack quite quickly. Okay. The next is also a, a question about irrigation. Were the trees that you showed deeply watered beyond the depth of the roots, or did the depth of the irrigation have an influence on how deep the roots went? Okay, the trees that were done in Germany and Austria were done in a, in a native forest. So they were just growing based on what the climate gave them. Uh, as far as I know, they get summer rains, so they were getting varying amounts of summer rains. Now, Dr. Weaver um, irrigated his plants with the vegetables because uh, they needed to keep them alive in a fairly dry summer. Uh, in Nebraska, it doesn't get a whole lot of rain. Um, but he's not very detailed. Uh, in fact, he doesn't even say how he irrigated them. But he talks about the depth of the root system based on the amount of rainfall. So I have one drawing in my book that shows that I think it was around 12 inches of rain. The, the wheat roots were down somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 6 to 12 inches deep. And when the rain doubled, tripled to 36 inches, the roots were down past the 24-inch zone. So the deeper you water, the more you can establish 
uh, deeper roots. Um, and contrary to what people think, if you don't water, most of the plants are not going to try to find deeper water because they would probably have to figure out how to go through dry soil to get to the deeper water. So the, I think that you water deep, so to speak, um, to get the best root system. But deep is uh, basically the top foot or two. I don't think you really have to worry much about beyond that because uh, in all climates, uh, the roots can find enough moisture uh, that exists in that lower zone uh, as, as it's been provided by nature. Um, so like in our climate, even though we don't get any rain the whole summer, still you go down eight feet, there's a fair amount of moisture relative to what a root needs. In your area, you get summer rains, you, you know, you've got adequate moisture most of the time all the way up to the surface, I would think. Well, in, in most summers, not this summer. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Our summer was more like your summer this year. Well, that's too bad. Uh, well, you have, to, you have to buy my drip irrigation book then. Put in drip irrigation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, plug, plug, this, plug. this is a follow-on to that question. Was the soil profile evaluated as a limiting factor for plant depth? Uh, yes, and so um, I forgot to mention that there were two uh, English oak drawings at the beginning, and one was down, the taproot was down past eight feet, but the next one, there were a whole lot more wide roots, and the tap roots were only down four or five feet. So in the book by the Germans, um, they go to great length describing the soil horizons, and it has a tremendous impact on uh, where the roots grow. So like we would expect, a clay hard pan um, would force more roots sideways so they can find the amount of cubic volume of soil they need to be happy. Okay. Do you think spending money on mycorrhizae fungus soil drench on root balls is a helpful technique? Oh, great. I'm glad they asked that. I have a whole chapter on mycorrhizae association in my book. And the basic summary of that whole chapter is to get to the explain why it is you're wasting your money buying the mycorrhizal inoculants. Some of them are pretty uh, expensive. Others are cheap. but it's not worth the money. Basically, any soil in a normal garden setting has the mycorrhizal fungi there. And it has the type that it likes to be there. In other words, when you buy an inoculant, you may be importing uh, fungi that didn't naturally grow in the area you have. And so they found that uh, when you put an inoculant into the soil, they start duking it out. The new stuff starts duking it out with the existing stuff and you have a, a war zone and you don't know which one's going to survive. Now let's say you've got a soil that's untouched uh, and it's got a lot of mycorrhizal association and you buy a container plant and because it's grown in a sterile soil medium you're worried about not enough mycorrhizal association. But in reality once you plant that in the garden the existing mycorrhizal association will quickly uh, so to speak invade the planting area and provide the impact that uh, they have. Um, so I, I try to discourage people from buying it, even though it's in our area, it's the hottest thing going. Everybody wants to buy mycorrhizae association uh, inoculant. Okay, that's that's very good to know. This listener is uh, interested in having you explain again the slot. The slide where you were next to the pile of leaves and mulch and the relationship of the mixture that you used for planting? Oh, the one where this guy in the lavender shirt um, uh, on top of the mound I made with the composting uh, tree waste. Is that the one you think you're talking about? I, I think so. Yeah. Um, so what I did is I got a load of fresh uh, uh, tree trimmings that had both leaf, cut up leaves and cut up 
wood, so it was more like a compost mix. And I piled it up three to four feet high in a mound that was the shape that I wanted for my swale. So next to it, I dug soil out of the ground and placed it four to six inches of soil on top of the mound of chips. So I didn't do anything to amend the soil. I just took the soil down to, my soil goes down to about 18 inches deep. So I took the top four to six inches, applied that to the top, uh, put it on top of the mound, and that gave me a nice fertile soil, but not amended. In other words, the roots are going to have to get used to the native soil, so there's no reason to waste time and money uh, amending the soil. Um, so that, that what you see in that photograph is a soil, untouched soil on top of the mound, and so even, if, even though it's untouched, I still make a little mound when I plant the lavender on top of the big mound. And the reason I did the mound is I needed drainage in that area so that the plant roots didn't rot. So by putting the mound uh, next to a swale, I dug the swale deeper to make the mound higher, and so I doubled my impact so the water became far away from the drainage water became far away from the root system on top of that mound. So I guess the critical point is that uh, you don't really need to amend the soil if you're able to gather native soil nearby. Okay. The next question is about uh, your uh, amendments that you were just talking about. So do you use any sorts of additional amendments in certain situations? Well, if you've got a really funky soil, and let's say you want to put in a bunch of petunias or vegetables, it might be better just to get a very fertile, highly amended soil and make a... Uh, a layer of that on top of the very funky soil, uh, but you would have to treat it like a container. In other words, uh, the roots growing through that loamy, fertile soil will grow like gangbusters, and then when they hit the native soil, it'd be like hitting a brick wall. They'll they'll stop growing and they won't uh, proliferate in the existing soil. So you have to keep the nutrients and the water happy in the the depth of the soil that you've added. So in other words, a lot of times people do raised beds for a bunch of reasons. Uh, it's very popular now to do raised beds for, for a bunch of reasons. But if you put in a very loamy mix on top of existing soil that's a little bit heavy, uh, you really got to watch what you're doing as far as keeping it moist so that the raised bed portion doesn't dry out too much. Okay. You mentioned that you only plant trees in the autumn. The question is, are there techniques that you could recommend if you need to plant trees in the spring? Right. As a landscaper, uh, practically speaking, I had to plant all year round. I couldn't just wait and plant all my clients' plant material in one month. <laughs> uh, it just wouldn't work out. So. Um, I plant, when I was a landscaper and planted year-round, I was careful to not amend the soil much uh, unless it was a horrible situation where I, where I had to mound, mound up some soil to get the depth I needed. Um, and then uh, I just dealt with, it all, with a lot of heavy mulch to keep things happier. But the thing is, in planting in the spring, summer, in California is a really bad time because the soil starts to dry out and if you don't provide adequate moisture the roots start uh, stop growing um, so planting in the spring or summer in California you really need to keep a consistent moisture going so the roots don't get uh, hammered by too dry of a situation. Okay the next question is, what is the best way to amend soil on a construction site that is a biological dead zone? And, oh if, and if you bring in topsoil and good compost, will that provide the necessary mycorrhizae? Uh, good question. I think on the mycorrhizae, um, if you buy topsoil from a supplier, 
they may not have much mycorrhizae in it because they may have gotten a, uh, uh, well, not sterile. In our area, they make topsoil, they grab uh, loam from somewhere, and then they add a whole bunch of stuff to it. Um, the possibility that there's mycorrhizae in that loam is pretty high. Um, I don't know of any test to see if there's mycorrhizae unless you see the filaments themselves. But usually when I buy topsoil, it's uh, uh, sometimes still hot from the composting material that's in it, and you wouldn't see much in the way of fungi. So basically, if I had a horrible situation, I tend to come in and try to spade in a small situation, use a spading fork to crack and heave the soil before adding the topsoil. So then I might uh, fork and heave, add two to four inches of topsoil that you purchased, fork and heave again, and then add two to four more inches, and then maybe till it or invert it just for the sake of trying to get a graduation from no amendment to slightly amended to highly amended uh, so that the roots of the highly amended zone can grow down and not get, the, not get a situation where they feel like they're hitting a brick wall, but they're going into deep, denser and denser soil gradually. So I don't have a problem with rototilling or tilling if it's only done once to get things off and running. Um, in a commercial situation, you really can't avoid it a lot of times. So, due to the constraints of time, money, and season, you often have to till. Um, but uh, as a digression, a lot of people are into no-till these days, and they talk about Ruth Stout, the queen of no-till. Well, if you read her book carefully, she uh, imported manure and tilled it in for 12 years before she started using her straw mulch. So I don't belong to any religion of gardening. So I feel that if you want to double dig your vegetable garden to get it off and running, you can do that. And after a certain number of years, you may be able to switch to no-till, no problem. But in a commercial setting like they're talking about with the topsoil, I have no problem with ripping it in a big area, ripping it with a, a big tractor using, uh, in our area, we go down four feet deep with ripping bars or rototilling in a small setting, <coughs> a small setting, and then dealing with the topsoil after it's applied. Now, if you feel that the supplier has mismanaged their production of topsoil, it certainly can't hurt to do mycorrhizal inoculant. Uh, whether or not you'd be wasting your money remains to be seen, uh, but to hedge your bets, if you can afford it in the budget, I would say go for it, but you've got to look for an inoculant that has a broad spectrum of the of the mycorrhizae. Um, some of them that are sold only have one or two species of the uh, I don't know how you pronounce it, gomus uh, genus, uh, whereas the ones that are better to get have 10, 12, 14 uh, species, uh, so that you've got a cross section of stuff because you don't know which one is going to be happiest in that soil. I hope okay. I didn't want it too much. <laughs> no, no, that's that's great. Thank you. We have time for just one last question and this refers back to a comment that you made earlier about irrigation and the listener would like to know what the book is that you were referring to on drip irrigation. Okay, it's on my website. Same website I got up there, robertcourt.com, and it's called Drip Irrigation for Every Landscape in All Climates. And the proposal is that drip irrigation where there's intermittent rains can pick up the slack and keep the soil exquisitely moist but not wet through the dry periods, even if it's, a, it's only three weeks of dry period, um, you'll get greater yields with drip than any other form of irrigation. So drip irrigation for every landscape and all climate, it's 20 bucks on my website, same price as uh, the root book. Okay, very good. Well, thank you, Robert, for all of these great insights into the underground world of roots. And thank you all for attending this webinar. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation and learned some tips. Good day and good gardening to you all. <laughs>